via telephone, Sheriff Nate Harmon. Nate, good morning. Thank you for calling in today. Well, good morning. I appreciate the opportunity. You were in the southern end of the state for the funeral services for Trooper Corey Maynard, who was uh, ambushed and killed in an attack uh, not that long ago. Uh, first and foremost, Nate, you were once a state trooper. I'm not sure if the timelines crossed, but did you know Trooper Maynard? Um, we did not personally work together as troopers. He came in in 2007 when I left at the latter part of 2006. Um, we He was stationed up here in Martinsburg when he first got out of the academy, and uh, I had uh, known him since, uh, but not uh, had the pleasure of working with him specifically. Trooper Maynard has uh, two children, ages 13 and 9, a wife, uh, Rachel. Friday, he was gunned down along with uh, another trooper. Uh, Nate, do you know any other facts of the case in regards to the shooting? I know he was responding to a shots, uh, shots fired call uh, where he was uh, uh, actually exiting his, his cruiser to uh, attempt to render aid in that situation and uh, was subsequently shot in the shoulder and abdomen. As a, a person who, who wears the uniform now as the sheriff of Berkeley County, former trooper, can you tell me when you get a news release like this, uh, can you tell me what's going through your mind and what you're feeling at that time? Um, the same exact feeling that uh, had any one of my biological brothers or sisters got uh, injured. Um, or something bad happened to them. Um, I can't, you know, the, the, the common question is, why do you do what you do? Um, and I have to say that when I went down there, and I'm on my way back, but when I was down there, the, the, the massive amount of uniformed officers from literally 10 other states, not to include the entire state, of West Virginia, the support, um, there was hundreds, probably well over a thousand, and every single one of them, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. When something happens to um, a fellow officer, because we know the sacrifices that are involved in doing this job, it literally has a ripple effect, not only across the state, but across the nation. And that's what I saw yesterday down there and uh even more so though um as bad as that hurts when we drove the uh procession to through williamson uh to chaplinsville through mingo county i, I gotta tell you that what i saw on the sides of the road all the uh fire trucks lifted american flags in the air you saw citizens of williamson Williamson and Chapmansville and Mingo County in general. God bless each, each and every one of those citizens because the support that they literally, I know I was driving for nearly an hour and I saw people on the side of the roads with their kids, with their American flags, with the signage saying we love our officers, we support our officers, American flags, blue line flags. It was such a heartfelt um, moment Um to drive through that and see these folks saluting uh, people with their hands over their hearts, uh, bikers, truckers. I think there was even a, a power plant that literally shut down or had to have shut down because I saw all the workers on the side of the road outside this power plant just uh, showing respect as we drove by. I mean, the the, the line in this uh, procession was, it was huge. It, it was blue, red lights as far as you could see for, I, I would guarantee you, at least three or four miles. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's the long answer to your question. But I can tell you right now, uh, we all hurt um, because of that loss. He was such a good uh, trooper, such a, a proactive trooper, a caring trooper, uh, and a, a loving father and husband. Uh, you heard his life, basically, um, there at the, at, at the funeral. And, and uh, just uh, hands down, just a solid good person. Sergeant Maynard spent some time here in the Eastern Panhandle. In fact, our uh, radio station engineer, Rodney Rockwell, told me a story last week about 
how Sergeant Maynard helped him in a dangerous incident uh, one evening when uh, some nefarious activity was taking place uh, yeah. and, and that crossed uh, paths with our engineer at the time who was uh, doing some work. And uh, Sergeant Maynard responded and uh, obviously took care of the situation. Uh, mm. The shooter, 29 years old, uh, was apprehended after a seven-hour manhunt and is in prison. Is there, at this time, any explanation for the shooting, Nate, that we are aware of? Not that I know of. Um, I know that he was involved in some criminal activity, obviously, which was which originated the call in the first place. He was the uh, suspect in the original shots fired call that Sergeant Maynard was going to. But other than that, I, you know, I thought about that even uh, as I'm driving. You know, you just honestly, it, 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 I don't. I would never even understand the the reason why yeah, that you, that one would have to do that. Um, yeah, Sergeant Maynard received the, uh, he received a life-saving reward for uh, a person who, uh, was a mental hygiene call who was trying to harm themselves and he, uh, disarmed the person from further injuring himself with this knife and, uh, he received a life-saving award for that. He was, uh, you know, named Trooper of the Year after only two years being in, in, in the uniform, which is a remarkable feat in and by itself. Um, if that speaks to, to a little bit about how proactive he was, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, even if I knew the reason why I, I wouldn't understand it, but I don't know the reason why. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> There's gotta be a way to, to undo the normalizing or normalization, if that's the word of this anti-cop rhetoric when media generally, Media and social media, in particular, there's this, this there's this drumbeat that normalizes a form of violence. Even, even in, in this case, it's the physical violence and the murder of of a state trooper. But we, we've got the spitting, and we've got you know all the, the the burning of police cars and such. This, I I don't know if there's a question here or not. I'm just I'm just kind of ramping uh, ranting. This, we there has to be a way to change this, and I don't I don't know what it is. And I think the pressure that you all must feel wearing the badge. Um, to, I, I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't, I guess I'm asking you if, if you have any ideas because this foments anger, of course. Right. And, and y'all are not in a position where you can express that anger, certainly not against other, uh, other individuals that you're dealing with on the street. Is there a way to turn this around? Or we just have to live through it and hope that the pendulum swings. No, I mean, the pendulum will swing, and I think it will swing simply for, for two things. That, come, that John, as soon as you mentioned that, well, I'll just add this. I thought about that same very thing, John, as I was driving from Chapmansville, and it's not there. What I saw yesterday in Mingo County, it is not there. There's thousands of citizens there like I said, it put a smile on my face for the whole hour I was driving. I was waving, looking at these folks. They truly support their law enforcement, and they truly care about them. But the two ways I think that we need to stay steadfast on and be a lot more proactive in is leadership needs to understand how valuable training is, whether that's verbal de-escalation, uh, autism awareness, um, use of force, uh, continuum uh, training, stress-induced uh, situational training that these these officers need to go through it is an investment it, it, yes it, it there is money that you have to invest in these officers the return that you get is a better well-rounded better equipped uh, officer that can handle these situations these emergent situations and the expectation is this right we have to make the right decision all the time in an emergency situation in a matter of seconds, whereas everybody else thereafter gets to quarterback it, that decision for weeks, if not months on end. One, folks need to have empathy for the actual situation that officers are placed in. Two, leadership needs to invest in the training so they can be more successful in situations just like that. But at the same time, we need to advocate that media stops putting black and white on top of uh, certain storylines. Uh, why does it always have to be white officer shoots black, black suspect uh, in a 
uh, armed uh, exchange? Why can't it just be, you know, uh, a citizen of, uh, I don't know, a citizen of uh, Berkeley County, um, you know, just like the, the officer-involved shooting that we had. There was no black, white, Hispanic, or anything attachment to that storyline, which is greatly appreciated. And I think media needs to stop doing it because they, I've read an article from Texas. Is this a, a small area in Texas where this guy, this officer, was used to be a, a corrections officer and was on the job for, I don't know, two, three years maybe. And he had an incident, which was a incident involving – him uh, discharging his weapon uh, at a, a situation that deemed the use of lethal force. And just because it was such a, it was literally a textbook situation, no racial bias at all. There, is, there was nothing there, but the media felt it necessary to make sure it was printed in black and white that this white officer shot this black suspect. You know, and I, I forget the actual details. It could have been like a, a, you know, an armed robbery at a grocery store or something like that that he foiled. Uh, but you know, if you're you're literally witnessing a felony happening in progress, and it, you know, you, the, the, there's no absolutely no thought of cultural, racial backgrounds at all when an officer makes a decision like that. And w- so I think media needs to do a better job. In, in, in censoring themselves to not fuel uh, uh, this this narrative, this and I call it a false narrative. But I actually think it's actually fueling what I call reverse racism. I mean, you're you're empowering folks to make these frivolous statements, and, and and that's what we're seeing. So I think one, we need to stay steadfast for training uh, as leadership. We need to invest in our folks, and two, I think we need to do a better job to keep pro, uh, you know. Stay on top of media, not to you know report the facts. Not you know that th- there's nothing racially biased or, co- or anything about color in this situation. Matt Harvey, I'm <clears throat> I'm going to make a statement because I knew Corey Maynard. I'd worked with him as assistant prosecutor and also uh, worked against him as a defense attorney. And Corey was a hero, absolutely. But he was a mm-hmm. hero long before he became a state trooper. He was a hero because of the way he chose to live his life, which he was a a very honorable man, and he was a family man, and he wanted nothing but to be a state trooper and serve his community, Mm -hmm. and he loved his home, which was where he ultimately gave his life uh, serving. Um, I know how much he meant um, to the other officers here in the Panhandle that he stood beside every day and um i know that they're going through quite a bit and uh i everything you hear about Corey is absolutely true he was he was he loved life he loved his brothers and sisters in uniform and he loved his community and he loved this state and um he was one of the good ones nathan as you know he yeah. it's like they broke the mold after they made him. He was he looked yeah. like he looked like a West Virginia state trooper. He looked like he yeah. was that uniform was made for him. And he was very prideful of his of his appearance, which speaks a lot about, you know, he j- just to his character, he of how mm. how how he attacked his job and he was a bulldog when it came to doing his job and serving his community. Uh, in fact, <laughs> when I was a defense attorney, he pulled me out of my house, not pulled, he called me and made me leave my leave, leave my house at 2 a.m. in the morning to to go to my office to work on a case that he, and pulled the prosecutor out, the assistant prosecutor, and, and we all had to meet at my office at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, because it was it was an important case and he was working it and he wouldn't let go. <laughs> so I had to learn to turn my ringer off. But that, it, I, I mean, that, and I was happy to do it because – it was the right thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, S- Sheriff, I, you know, I, I wanted to say that because I, I knew him. I had the privilege of knowing him. And how are the other people that up here, the other officers, his brothers and sisters? I, I know everyone I'm one to make it but couldn't, but how are they coping and how are they dealing with this? No, they're crushed. They're crushed. Um, um, I, I know how much pain I'm feeling. I can't imagine – um, the fo- we we brought we brought a, a, just a, a large contingent from our office down there. I mean, you got troopers. I mean, and regardless of the uniform you wear, 
we're all doing the same thing. But you have former troopers that work for Berkeley County Sheriff's Office now. Uh, former trooper uh, Brian Snap, former trooper uh, Brooke Hott, uh, two of which that uh, we took with us. And you know what? Um, I feel really, really bad for them. They work side by side with uh, Corey, and uh, they're hurt. They're hurt. So we're just uh, being there for them as best as we can, um, supporting them with whatever needs uh, that they may have, uh, and helping them get through this. And, I, you know, it's this is where the spouse comes in, right, because uh, these folks that went with us, uh, they brought their wives. And, uh, you know, just to see them comforting each other, uh, that was a blessing to see too. I know that Mary Beth Cole also has helped with a, a GoFundMe that's mm. that's contributing. It's also I yeah. think set up by a part of she's down there with us. Yep, Corey's family. So I, I don't know where it's at on Facebook, but it does exist and it's doing really well. And it could always use some more. Yeah, if you just go to GoFundMe dot com, you put in uh, Trooper uh, State West Virginia State Trooper Corey Maynard's name, it'll come up for you. Yeah. Now a second trooper was wounded as well, right? In, mm, in I this don't incident? know the details of that, though. There, okay. was a, there, there, there was someone else that was shot, but it was not a trooper. It wasn't a trooper. Okay. It was the, no, the I, reason I for the call. I think that was actual citizen. That they I were. see. Okay. Uh, uh, I do know that, uh, you know, in the same week, the uh, you know, you have the canine officer from Morgantown PD who got in an off-duty uh, traffic accident and had passed. But, yeah, that's, that's a tough blow when you get uh, two – um, two of our brothers that, that get uh, injured or, or it's literally just uh, are passing the same week. It's it's tough to deal with. And his name was Zane Brickiron for the right. listeners. Uh, Nate, I want to ask you, uh, if we switch gears here for a second in regards to, the, I had Steve Stolifer on yesterday, the Jefferson County Commission president in regards to an ordinance that was passed three to two by the Jefferson County Commission Last week, in regards to what could be considered to be lewd or obscene performances, vulgar uh, is also a word that was used in uh, describing the performances and limiting minors' attendance with the possibility of a misdemeanor attached to that, a fine of up to $500, potentially 30 days in jail if you're in violation of the ordinance. Uh, I got a text from you at the time commenting on that. Uh, it seems like the Jefferson County Commission has placed the onus of enforcement of this on the sheriff's department of Jefferson County without a lot of guidelines. And we're going to have Jennifer Krause on the show on Monday. Steve Stolliver yesterday couldn't offer a whole lot as to who will be in charge of enforcing it and how. Uh, can you tell me if something like that occurred in Berkeley County, what would be the, the deputy's responsibility in terms of determining what qualifies as that type of behavior and who would be in violation of it? Well, I, I can tell you this. It, it, it upset me to hear what I heard uh, when that topic was talked about. Because I can tell you this, especially with the folks that we have now on the county council uh, and the ones before, we, there, we have healthy discussions about a lot of things. And I'd be daggone if they're going to pass an ordinance that's going to result in me having to enforce it having never gotten my input or, or uh, uh, um, advice at all, uh, and then turn around, pass, and then, then tell me uh, I have to enforce. One, that, that would never happen here. I can assure you that. But two, hypothetically, if it ever did, I'd say to them, I'd say, I'm not enforcing that. Um, you can take that back to you, your office, and you can have whoever you want to enforce it. And if it's in, unconstitutionally out of kilter, then we're going to have additional conversations in turn. Now, I totally agree, don't get me wrong, with the ordinance content, or let's just say the, the subject line in and by itself. I, I do agree with that, and I, I wouldn't mind seeing one here, uh, actually. But what upset me was I thought I heard that there was actually no effort to either include the sheriff or the sheriff input wasn't provided. I mean, it's one thing if if the sheriff's invited and it's just, you know, whatever happens, he, he doesn't, he or she doesn't make it or, or turns the opportunity down. That's one thing. I'm not talking about that. But what I heard was that they passed an ordinance without that, that is a, and 
enforced by the sheriff's department without even including the sheriff. That would not happen here, and if it did, uh, I would not enforce it. I, I do believe Steve Stolifer indicated that yesterday in that he said, as far as he knew, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department's input was not requested on that or at least not uh, not offered. So, John Gilstrap, do you have a question for Does a sheriff that? have that level of discretion to, I mean, just in general, not for this ordinance, but in general, can a sheriff just say, no, I'm not going to enforce that? A sheriff, yes, 100% he does. That's a question. <laughs> it's a surprise. I didn't know that. And, and a quick it, answer, it, too. It, as a constitutional sheriff, it, I feel I am obligated. It is my duty to the citizens to make sure that there's not overreach involved, that there's there's the, the issue. Well, I'll, I'll just use the executive orders during the COVID times. You can't shut private businesses down if they're abiding by certain health codes and stuff and not endangering the public. You can't shut. You can't do that. So. So I'll use Les's Barbershop, for example. That is the prime example where a sheriff needs to come in and say, well, Board of Cosmetology, I'm not enforcing what you seemingly feel to be as a violation because this gentleman has built this business and he has a right to, to this uh, free liberty uh, and, and, and um, you know, building his own business, and I don't have a right to shut that down unless it's con contributing to uh, if it if it is actually putting the the uh, public in danger uh, 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 and in harm's way I, that's what a sheriff does so Nate, if I'm looking at on that note I got to jump in because I've, I've got a hard break I got to take here at the end so I, I appreciate your cooperation yeah. on this and uh, let's hook up again uh, with a more conversation on this next week or so yeah absolutely thank you Nate